coming up later in the podcast. And she said, do you realize that when you tell lies, you hurt Jesus in his heart? And I was absolutely flabbergasted. Remember, I was only seven or eight. I was so traumatized and upset by what I had been told. The teacher said, get out of my classroom. He was sent outside the door for daring to raise an alternative explanation. On day one of my teaching degree, one of the leading professors on the course is recommending that I abandon the course, that I should not be a religion teacher simply because I am an atheist. Hello, everybody, and welcome to A Magician's Thoughts on the podcast, where you get a magician's perspective on a whole host of topics. You guys are very, very welcome to this episode. Can I just start off by saying I absolutely love you all? I really, really mean that. I always thought, you know, that my magic videos, you know, trying to make the most entertaining video possible, trying to come up with really amazing illusions and teaching you guys how to do some tricks. I thought those videos would be the most popular on the channel. And, you know, I'm not going to stop making those and, and they still are popular. But uh, the podcast seems to be trumping everything else. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, and I, I hate to uh, shatter the illusion for some of you listening, but the podcast is just me talking into a microphone. Now, don't get me wrong, the discussion of the topics themselves is not necessarily easy. Uh, if you've been listening to the podcast thus far, you know that I delve into many controversial and complex topics, and today is going to be no different. But I guess I just wanted to say thank you very much, guys. I mean, really and truly, I never expected that people would care what I had to say. I never thought in a million years that people would want to listen to my voice for 40 minutes at a time. But uh, lo and behold, here we are. And I just wanted to express my gratitude for that. So in any case, today's topic is indoctrination. And a very, very big topic. I'm going to start off by defining it and uh, we'll go from there. But just before we get to that uh, definition. I just wanted to say before we begin, guys, this is going to be the most personal episode of the podcast that I've done thus far. So this is going to be very autobiographical. I'm going to share things with you in this particular podcast that I've never spoken about uh, publicly in, in a published piece of work like this. I mean, those who know me closely, uh, friends and family and so forth will know the details of the stories that I'm about to relay, but I've never spoken about what I'm about to speak about in a public forum. And so some of what I'm about to say is deeply personal, and some of what I'm about to say is actually incredibly controversial. Uh, some of it might even be um, actionable, legally speaking, uh, but you know, we'll get to that in a moment. And uh, I'm speaking, of course, about um, the I would argue, illegal manner in which I was treated in at various times in relation to indoctrination. Uh, but, you know, I'll, that's as much as I'll say about that for now. We'll get to that a while later. I just want to crawl before we walk and run. So to begin, guys, what is indoctrination? Well, as per usual, I've taken the liberty of Googling the term and the definition that Google gives us uh, in this particular instance is actually quite good. Google defines indoctrination as the process of teaching a person or a group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. The key word in that definition there is the word uncritically, right? That's very, very important. And uh, yeah, so guys, indoctrination is not a good thing, right? Certainly not where education is concerned. And uh Look, I'm going to start right off the bat with this kind of personal account. Let's start at the beginning. I was raised Catholic, guys, okay? Uh, for those of you who don't know, some of you may not be uh, very religiously literate. Uh, Catholicism is a denomination uh, or otherwise known as a version of Christianity, Right. I won't get into what the tenets of Catholicism are. Perhaps that's a topic for another day. All you need to know for now is that Catholicism is a denomination or version of Christianity. So I was raised Catholic. Right. I went to a Catholic school. I learned prayers. I went through the rituals of communion and confirmation. I attended church, etc. Right. And um, for all intents and purposes, guys, I, I had a good education, an education that enabled me to eventually become a teacher myself. 
So for those of you who don't know, I'm not a full-time magician or YouTuber. My primary job is still that of a secondary school teacher, but I digress. Many of you listening may be thinking that, you know, my Catholic education, considering what it allowed me to achieve, I mean, it sounds harmless, if not wholesome, uh, quite a wholesome upbringing, right? Who cares if it was Catholic? And what's more, some might suggest, if your parents wanted they could have sent you to a non-Catholic or indeed a non-religious or secular school, right? But as per usual, guys, the devil really is in the details. So I'm going to delve into some of the complexities of the Irish education system. And having been educated and raised in Ireland, guys, that is my experience. Now, I am pressingly aware that some of the details I'm about to go through are also relevant in other nations. And, you know, I want to ask you a favor right off the bat. If and when I raise certain details that remind you of the education system in your country, wherever you might be listening from, this isn't just a cheap YouTuber's ploy right now. I'm actually genuinely interested. I would really deeply appreciate if you would hop into the comments below and tell me if your education system is similar, if not the same. So as I go through the details, again, just remember, I would love to get some feedback. If your education system is the same or or has even some similarities, I'd love to know because one of the reasons I'm producing this particular episode of the podcast is because I'm aware that I have an array of international listeners and I'm very intrigued to learn about the details of your education systems also and to what extent indoctrination is quote baked in so do keep that in mind guys remember it's not a cheap youtuber's ploy i'm not just trying to you know up the engagement on my video um albeit it will serve that purpose as well in this particular instance uh, i'm actually just very interested to know what the status quo is in various countries but for now guys what you need to know is this The near monopolistic position of the Catholic Church within the Irish education system is a massive and concerning human rights issue. And worse still, guys, the legal framework in Ireland further complicates the situation. Now, I'll get into what all of this means as we go through it. Um, When I say that the Catholic Church has a monopolistic position in the Irish education system, what I mean is that the Catholic Church owns the vast majority of primary schools and most of the secondary schools. So they are run and conducted under what's referred to as a Catholic ethos. And we'll get into what that means a little bit later on. But this is this is a problem, guys. And the legal framework makes it much worse. I'll give you an example of the legal framework. So the rules for national schools, that's the name of a document. It's the governing document for schools in Ireland. The rules for national schools is a comprehensive document dealing with all aspects of how primary state-funded schools should be run. So we're talking now specifically, guys, about primary education. Some of you might call it kindergarten. Uh, some of you might call it preschool. I'm not so sure. I think it, the, the, the nomenclature is, is different depending on which part of the world you're in. But essentially, I'm talking about kids who are educated from the age of five to approximately the age of 12, right? In Ireland, those schools run under the Rules for National Schools document. And though dated, the rules have been accepted as being binding in the courts of Ireland. And as such, they're adhered to by every state-funded primary school in the country, The controversy, guys, pertaining to this document surrounds one specific rule, and that is rule number 68. Rule number 68, which I'm about to read to you, says the following. Of all the parts of a school curriculum, religious instruction is by far the most important as its subject matter. God's honour and service includes the proper use of all man's faculties and affords the most powerful inducements to their proper use. Religious instruction is, therefore, a fundamental part of the school course and a religious spirit should inform and vivify the whole work of the school. I'm going to read that last part of the quote one more time. Religious instruction is, therefore, a fundamental part of the school course, and a religious spirit should inform and vivify the whole work of the school, end quote. So, guys, I'm sure straight off the bat, any intelligent listener can hear the problem right there. 
religion, guys, is not confined to the religious classroom in Irish education, in primary or secondary for that matter, but we'll get on to secondary a little bit more later on. Uh, For now, just be aware that religion extends and transcends the religion classroom. It really does. What is being prescribed here has come to be known as, quote, the integrated curriculum. And this is an educational approach defined by the permeation of religious instruction throughout all subjects and school activities. So in other words, guys, religion isn't confined, as I said, to the religion classroom. It's expressed throughout the curriculum and the school building, right? So there's a crucifix on every wall in every classroom, right? You say grace before meals, there's prayers in the morning time and so on. And so the question is, how can one opt out of this kind of system without just leaving the school altogether. Because this is one of the key arguments, isn't it, guys? People say, well, you know, if you don't like religious education, if you don't like the religion classroom, why can't you just opt your child out of the religion classroom and then they'd be free from that influence? Well, I'm sorry, but there's no such luck. That's not the case. You can't be opted out because religion occurs in many of the subjects. It comes up in many areas and is... Um, present in the day-to-day activities and the running of the school. As I said, there are morning prayers, grace before meals, crucifixes and religious imagery hanging on walls throughout the school building. And this is the case for the vast majority. We're talking about the 90th percentile. So guys, in a country where the Catholic Church runs the vast majority of primary schools, this rule poses a serious threat to the human rights of those who identify as non-Catholic. What's truly shocking about Rule 68 is that it was only repealed in 2016. Imagine that. This rule was in place for decades and was only repealed in 2016. But worse still, the removal of this rule actually changes nothing. It changes nothing at all. I'm going to read an excerpt from an article, which I'll link in the description, entitled Removing Rule 68 on its own will change nothing. The article is dated January 29th, 2016, and I quote, The Minister for Education and Skills, Jan O'Sullivan, has removed Rule 68 of the Rules for National Schools. Removing Rule 68 on its own is a purely symbolic gesture. Nothing will actually change on the ground in our publicly funded schools. Atheist Ireland agrees with the Catholic Church that removing Rule 68 will not remove the religious ethos from our schools. The Human Rights and Equality Commission also agrees with us and the Catholic Church. Integrating religion into all secular subjects is part of a Catholic ethos. Atheist Ireland has repeatedly pointed out that removing Rule 68 will not remove the religious integrated curriculum from our schools. End quote. The problem is, guys, that despite the repealing of Rule 68, the Education Act from 1998 actually provides an indirect sanction to the religious integrated curriculum. But again, to continue with this article, and I quote, Section 15 of the Education Act 1998 indirectly sanctions the religious integrated curriculum in publicly funded schools. All schools in Ireland are obliged to uphold the ethos of the patron. Part of the ethos, characteristic spirit of the Catholic Church, is that religion must be integrated in all subjects under the curriculum, as otherwise it would put the faith of Catholic students in peril. In the report Religion and Education, a Human Rights Perspective, the Human Rights Commission stated that the Education Act may also be regarded as providing indirect sanction to the integrated curriculum insofar as it makes boards of management accountable to the patron for upholding the characteristic spirit of the school. End quote. So guys, the problem is that the Irish government doesn't actually run Irish schools. They have outsourced that responsibility to what they call patrons. And the Catholic Church, at the time this decision was made, basically had a complete monopoly and consequently to this day owns over 90%, I've seen some statistics say 96%, some say even 99% of all the schools in Ireland. And the Education Act 1998 gives the Catholic Church the permission, despite the repealing of Rule 68, it gives them permission to conduct the day-to-day running of their schools under a Catholic ethos. So I'm going to quote the article once again. As it says, As you can see in the above section, 
The Education Act 1998 indirectly sanctions a religious integrated curriculum. This is a breach of human rights law. And it goes on to point out that, and I quote, atheist and secular parents are obliged to send their children to publicly funded schools with a Catholic ethos. The purpose of a Catholic ethos is to evangelize children into a religious way of life. So guys, that is the problem. The vast majority of schools in the country are run by the Catholic Church and the Education Act 1998, with or without Rule 68 of the Rules for National Schools, permits these schools to operate under a religious, or more specifically, a Catholic ethos. So to those of you who want to raise the argument about public and private and state separation, you know, some of you might suggest, but you know, if those are private schools and the patrons run them, then those patrons are entitled to run them in whatever manner they like. Yeah, I would agree with you if that patron didn't have a complete monopoly over the education system. Remember, the Catholic Church owns approximately 96% of all the schools in Ireland. How can you say that it's permissible for that patron to run those schools in a manner that only supports the rights of one select group in society, namely Catholics, right? What about all of the non-Catholics? What about all of the irreligious people? What about all the atheists and secular people? A society must respect the rights of all individuals. That's what human rights are all about, guys. You must respect everyone's rights. You can't pander to a single denomination of one religion. You can't do that. That is a human rights violation. It's very simple. But I digress. How can one opt out of a particular subject if its influence permeates the entire school? So I'm going to quote two scholars right now. Uh, one's name is Natalie Rougier, and the other one is uh, Isyult uh, Honahan. I, I hope I've pronounced those correctly. And they said the following. In theory, a student can be exempted from any subject that is contrary to the conscience of the parent or student, a practice referred to as the opt-out clause. However, in an integrated curriculum, opting out is not effective. End quote. So guys, I couldn't agree more with these scholars. I think they're spot on. To reiterate, opting out is a pointless exercise in the context of an integrated curriculum. That much is clear. Again, guys, the school building contains religious imagery, pictures of the Holy Mary and Jesus Christ, and there's crucifixes hung on every wall. Students say morning prayers. There is grace before meals at lunchtime, right? And this is where I'm going to get even more personal and even more deep because, guys, I was raised in this system. And there are some awful examples from my uh, childhood and my education that demonstrate the rather insidious nature of this all-encompassing Catholic approach. So I remember when I was in primary school, remember some of you might call that preschool or kindergarten and so on, but I remember when I was in primary school, and I remember one April Fool's Day, um, I think it was, you know, during lunchtime or something. Uh, we, it wasn't a standard lesson because we were out of our seats, I, I recall. I must have only been around um, eight, seven or eight at this point in time. It was April Fool's Day, and I remember uh, playing with one of my friends, and I told him, oh my God, there's someone behind you. And he turned around, and of course, there was no one there. And I said, hi, April Fool's Day. And you will not believe this. You really will not believe this. And as sure as I'm sitting here talking into this microphone, I promise you that this happened exactly as I'm describing it. I remember my teacher approaching me and saying, you know, Dara, when you said that there was somebody behind Ian, was the name of my friend, by the way. You know when you said that there was somebody behind Ian? And I said, yeah. You know that that wasn't true. And I said, yeah, it's April Fool's Day. I, I, I told a little fib because it was funny when he turned around and there was no one there. And she said, do you realize that when you tell lies, you hurt Jesus in his heart? And I was absolutely flabbergasted. Remember, I was only seven or eight. I was so traumatized and upset by what I had been told. And I went home that evening from school and I said to my mother, Ma'am, I'm really sorry. And she said, what's wrong? I've hurt Jesus in his heart. And she said, what are you talking about? And I told her the story as I told you the story right now. 
And she said, thankfully, to my mother's credit, she had wisdom. To my mother's credit, she said, don't you listen to your teacher. That's only a load of old nonsense. Not to say that my mother didn't believe in Jesus or that my mother wasn't religious, but she knew, despite her religious beliefs, that this was ridiculous. This was clearly an example of intolerant Catholicism. Clearly, I was an innocent child who was getting involved in the fun of April Fool's Day. And there are other stories, guys. I remember one time, and, you know, moving on to secondary school for a moment, I remember when we were in religion class in secondary school, and our teacher was uh, telling us about creationism, you know, this idea that God created the universe and human beings and so on and so forth. And I remember my friend Brendan raising his hand and saying, but, you know, miss, does evolution not explain where life comes from? Surely it wasn't God. And as soon as Brendan had the words out of his mouth, the teacher said, get out of my classroom. He was sent outside the door for daring to raise an alternative explanation. And, you know, if you want to know my point of view, the obviously true explanation, not to say that evolution explains where life comes from, it doesn't, but evolution does a remarkably good job of explaining why there's a variety of life, and it certainly challenges uh, religious explanations. You know, the, the story of Adam and Eve and how human beings were just summoned into existence Adam was created from the clay and Eve was created from Adam's rib and so on. That's a very different explanation from, you know, millions of years of evolution and natural selection. Again, evolution doesn't explain the origin of life, but it certainly does a remarkable job of explaining the complexity of life and why there's such a variety and so forth. But my point is this, Brendan actually raised a fascinating point and his point could have led to a fascinating discussion. It absolutely could have. We could have spoken about the conflict between science and religion, or the lack thereof, depending on your perspective. I don't want to assume too much about your point of view, dear listener. But the point is, a, a fascinating discussion could have come from Brendan's comment, but instead, Brendan was reprimanded and sent outside the door. And guys, speaking as an educator, I am a religion teacher. I also teach history, and I also teach a subject called citizenship, which many of you may not have heard of, but in any case, speaking as a teacher in today's day and age, not much has changed in Ireland. Now, I must admit that I currently teach in the UK, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, which, again, I'm going to get into a little bit later in the podcast. But for now, from my limited experience teaching in Ireland, it wasn't clear to me that much had changed at all. Religion still dominates in this way. Catholicism is still the theme of the day. So to... Bring this full circle. Simply put, guys, the Irish state has completely failed to address the concerns of those parents who desire either a multi or a non-denominational education for their children. Just to clarify what those terms mean, a non-denominational education would be a primary school education which did not prefer a particular denomination of Christianity. And a multi-denominational approach is one which kind of embraces multiple denominations simultaneously. But unfortunately, the state has not addressed this issue. As it stands, the facts on the ground remain unchanged. The vast majority of primary schools and secondary schools, for that matter, are still run by the Catholic Church, meaning that religion permeates the entire curriculum and the building. Now, some listeners might suggest that Catholic education can actually be carried out in an equal and inclusive manner. And in other words, you know, opting out might not be necessary. But speaking from firsthand experience as both a child who was raised in this system and as a teacher who worked within it, and as someone who's familiar with the data on top of all this, guys, I'm unconvinced that a, quote, neutral approach is possible. So if it's not already clear, what is at stake here, guys, is the constitutional right of parents to choose, according to their conscience, a suitable education for their children. As it states in the Constitution itself, and I quote, the state shall not oblige parents in violation of their conscience and lawful preference to send their children to schools established by the state or to any particular type of school designated by the state, end quote. While this article affords parents the right to choose an appropriate education for their children, the fact is, guys, such a choice is practically non-existent in the Irish context. In fact, only 41 
and you know these figures are perhaps somewhat dated but not much has changed i assure you only 41 out of approximately 3,171 primary schools in the country are multi-denominational. And let me say, guys, having taught in some of those multi-denominational schools, the Catholic ethos permeates those schools as well. Don't kid yourself. Don't pretend even for a second that those 41 schools are beacons of objectivity and neutrality. They're not. Therefore, most parents have little choice but to send their children to denominational schools, a.k.a. Catholic schools, guys. In short, non-Catholic parents face, I would argue, a harrowing decision, guys. They either send their children to a Catholic school, thereby discounting their own religious convictions, or lack thereof, you know, they might be atheists, or they just forego sending their children to a school altogether, opting instead for a homeschooling option. And let's be fair, it doesn't require much thought to identify the unfair nature of this choice. But there is a third option for parents who find themselves in such a position. Some commentators on this topic, guys, and you won't believe this, they've had the audacity to suggest that by assembling with other like-minded parents, non-Catholics can just form their own schools. (laughs) Simple, right? Just set up your own school. Problem solved. But this, guys, come on. Seriously, this is an unreasonable burden to place on the shoulders of parents who simply want their children educated in the absence of indoctrination. So I want to read a quote to you. This comes from a constitutional and human rights lawyer. Her name is Alison uh, Mawini. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, but she says, this process of setting up a school is a daunting one. The voluntary group of parents must establish itself, develop school policies, establish and operate a pupil enrollment procedure, form management structures, select staff, and secure and pay for temporary accommodation. Guys, I don't think I really need to say this, but suffice to say, this is an extraordinary undertaking to expect of parents who wish simply to choose a non-Catholic education for their children. I mean, come on. By the same token, it is unfair to expect such parents to homeschool their children, as few would feel either competent to undertake homeschooling, or they wouldn't be in a financial position to consider it. Because most people need to work. 99% of people need to work. They can't stay at home and teach their kid. Of course they can't. They wouldn't be able to pay their bills if they did so. So in summary, guys, Catholic schools are the only realistic option available to the children of non-Catholic parents in Ireland. And consequently, the state's failure to establish either multi- or non-denominational schools constitutes, in my view, a breach in both the constitutional and human rights of those parents and children. I think that is inarguable. Now, if I fail to consider something, again, please do jump into the comments below and enlighten me. But I can't see a way around this. I think it's abundantly clear that Ireland is failing its citizens, specifically its non-Catholic or non-religious citizens. My point right now applies equally to atheists and people of, of any faith other than Christianity. This applies to anyone who's not a Catholic. You might be Christian and be Protestant, and you're equally put out by these policies. And if you don't believe me, guys, when I say that there's a problem here, you don't have to. Numerous international human rights bodies have criticized Ireland and strongly recommended that the state meet the demand for both multi- and non-denominational schools. So I'll give you an example. In 2011, the Committee for the Elimination of Racism and Discrimination stated the following. And I quote, the education system in the state party is still largely denominational and is mainly dominated by the Catholic Church. The committee further notes that non-denominational or multi-denominational schools represent only a small percentage of the total and regrets that, according to reports, there are not enough alternative schools. And guys, despite these recommendations... And despite the recommendations of other bodies, such as the Irish Human Rights Commission or the Council of Europe and so on, the state has failed to implement any measures in order to deal with the situation. So before we come to the end, I want to tell you one final story. This is, again, another personal anecdote, guys. 
I stand by this story and it is true as the day it occurred. And I'm convinced that I could have potentially legally complained about what happened here. But as you know, I, I am a teacher. I'm an educator. I've been fully qualified now since 2014 and have been teaching more or less ever since. I teach in the UK and I, I'm going to get into uh, why that is the case in a moment, but I'll, I'll go chronologically. During my teaching degree, guys, and remember, a teaching degree is done at third level. So I went through the primary education system. I went through the secondary education system as a student, experienced all of the examples of indoctrination I've explained throughout this podcast thus far. And I thought, as soon as I escape secondary school, that's it now. I'm done with Catholic indoctrination. I'm free. Lo and behold, I enter third level, the university education system, and my old pal, i.e. Catholic indoctrination, was still present. How gutted was I? What am I talking about? When I did my teaching degree, guys, and again, you won't believe this, on day one, on day one of my teaching degree, we had an introductory lecture by a lecturer in University College Cork, a, a university which I adore, by the way. This lecturer shall remain nameless because I worry and I suspect that I might be getting myself into legal trouble if I do name this person. But let's just say that this person is is pretty high up in the hierarchy, especially when it comes to the education of teachers. Day one, uh, we get an orientation lecture by this particular individual. And at the end of the lecture, I approach this person and I just wanted their advice because I was nervous, right? I approached them and I said, look, um, thank you very much for the lecture. It was very informative and I feel much more settled because the very next day, guys, I was about to embark upon my first day of real life in the classroom teaching. For those of you who don't know, a teaching degree requires that you secure a placement in an actual functioning school. And whilst studying and learning and writing essays and attending lectures, uh, there are scheduled points throughout the week where you teach actual lessons with real children so that you're both practicing and learning your theory simultaneously. So my first teaching lesson, my first actual real lesson was going to be the very following day and naturally enough I was very apprehensive and so at the end of this lecture as I said I I walked down to the front and I asked this lecturer this professor um, for some advice I said look my subject is religion and I just want your advice about how I should navigate that in the classroom because I myself am an atheist I said and um, should I be honest about my convictions or should I keep it private or, you know, is it is it the student's business? If they ask me, should I just decline to answer the question or h- how should I approach it? You know, to what extent are the personal views of the teacher uh, permitted? And, you know, I was just I was just interested because, you know, I'd come from an education where teachers spent all of their time telling me that they believed in God. And so at this point in time, I didn't have the clarity on the topic that I have now. So I was wondering Uh, would it be permissible to mention that I'm an atheist? I mean, if people can tell you that they're religious and be an educator, why can't you say that you're not religious? On that note, to this day, uh, I don't talk about my atheism in the classroom. I I leave that aside. I've come to the conclusion that I don't think it's appropriate for a teacher to discuss their own private views because that unduly influences the students in the classroom, right? I think the teacher should keep their opinions to themselves. So I think that's that's really important. But at this point in time, it is to say I hadn't come to that conclusion yet. And I was asking this lecturer about it. And to my shock, his jaw dropped and he said, now, remember, this is my very first day learning to be a teacher. It's day one of my teaching degree. And what does this guy say to me? His jaw drops and he says, what are you doing being a religion teacher? You shouldn't be a religion teacher. And I was like, what? I swear on day one of my teaching degree, one of the leading professors on the course is recommending that I abandon the course, that I should not be a religion teacher simply because I am an atheist. He says to me, well, you know, you have to be able to speak French in order to teach French, don't you? To which I said, and I think it was a good response, I said, of course you have to be able to speak French in order to teach French. 
but you don't have to be French to teach French. And I think that's the true analogy here. You don't have to be a Nazi to teach Nazism. History teachers up and down the country every day of the week teach students about Nazism without themselves being followers of the Fuhrer. Are you kidding me? So in his view, it was essential to be a Catholic in order to teach religion. But how ridiculous is that? And for those of you who may have had sympathy for that point of view, I'm hoping right now that I'm going to change your mind. Really and truly, do you have to be religious to teach religious education? Of course not. Just like you don't have to be a Nazi to teach Nazism. You can be an outsider and still be incredibly learned and know all of the tenets of whatever it is that you're teaching and convey it successfully and teach a class. In fact, I would argue that you might actually be better placed. I'm not convinced that the fact that the vast majority of my religion teachers in the past were Christian actually benefited my education. If anything, it harmed or hurt it. Remember in secondary school when Brendan was sent outside the door. That could have been an incredible educational experience for us all if that debate had proceeded, if we had discussed the merits of evolution vis-a-vis creationism. That would have been a very valuable learning experience for everybody involved. But instead, that conversation was halted and the student who dared to question the teacher was punished. I'm not convinced that being religious is necessarily beneficial at all. If anything, an atheist might be best placed to teach religion, provided, as I said earlier, that they keep their opinions out of it. Remember, guys, I wouldn't support an atheistic teacher either. I wouldn't support a religion teacher who went in and said to the students, by the way, guys, there is no God, get over it. And by the same token, I don't support a teacher who goes into the classroom and says there is a God and this is how you should pray to him. Both are wrong. Teachers are meant to teach, not preach. But this university level lecturer is telling me on day one of my degree that I have no business there. That is absolutely shocking. I told this story to another lecturer in the university with whom I had a very close relationship at the time. And um, again, I won't name names, but ironically, that lecturer was from the actual religion department in University College Cork. And that professor told me that I should probably seek legal action, that I should contact the European Court of Human Rights. I didn't because I was young and idiotic, but I swear if I had my time back, I would have made a different decision. I didn't realize how big an issue it was. I didn't realize that what was actually happening was a clear and present example of discrimination against non-believers. I was being denigrated simply because I was an atheist. Absolutely unbelievable. And then sure enough, I, I ignored that, I'm sorry to say, moron. I'm happy to report that I went on. I absolutely smashed my teaching degree did excellently, graduated with honours, and went on to become a teacher. So, you know, the story has a happy ending, but then, guys, it didn't even end when I left university either. Just as when I left secondary school, I thought, I'm finally escaping the clutches of the Catholic Church, and then, lo and behold, I walk into my teaching degree, and I meet it again. When I left my teaching degree, I thought, okay, finally, I can escape the clutches of the Catholic Church, and then I enter the job market and I try to find a teaching job in Ireland. And now we're getting to the point where I'm going to explain why I actually teach in the UK. Guys, the Catholic ethos, the Catholic monopoly also bleeds into the employment process. Remember, the vast majority of schools in Ireland, both primary and secondary, are run under a Catholic ethos. So it's not surprising that when they're employing people, they're looking to employ Catholics. Don't believe me? Well, guys, I've got some examples for you. When I went to interviews, and I shit you not, I shit you not, when I went to interviews, I was asked, how am I going to bring the children to the Lord? To which I said, well, I'm not going to do that, of course, because I'm here to teach, not preach. You think I got that job? You think I could get a job, being honest? That same professor I mentioned earlier, the one who advised me to go to the European Court of Human Rights, again in this instance advised me to go to the European Court of Human Rights. He also recommended that perhaps I should just lie. He said to me at the time, and it was a very interesting comment he made, I couldn't see the wisdom in it at the time, but I see it now. What he said was, Dari, you're just going to have to lie. 
You're going to have to just pretend that you're Catholic so that you can get your foot in the door. Because if teachers with integrity like you continue to be honest about their desire to teach objectively and to not indoctrinate children, if you continue to be honest, teachers like you are never going to get a foot in the door. And the Irish education system is never going to change. So it's a very interesting point of view he raised. And uh, I think he might have been right. But yes, guys, in interviews, I was asked how I was going to bring the children to the Lord. And needless to say, I said that I wouldn't. And so, guys, I couldn't get a job in Ireland. I often blame it on the overcrowded job market, and that certainly played a role. But you'd have to be just ignoring the story. You'd have to just bury your head in the sand to ignore the role that Catholicism played in my inability to procure employment. These questions were common. I only wish, if I had my time back, that I had brought a recorder into the interview. You know, I could have just hit record on my phone and had it in my pocket. These interviews would have been television worthy. They would have been worthy of a courtroom, guys. Again, I was being discriminated against simply because I refused to partake in the ugly indoctrination machinery that is the Catholic education system in Ireland. If the details of these stories don't shock you, I hope I don't offend you when I say that you're probably just not paying attention. These stories are appalling. And you know, these stories are actually quite tame compared to what previous generations went through. Our parents, my parents' generation, who were beaten within an inch of their lives in some instances by the Christian brothers and the nuns. The Catholic Church's power in Ireland knew no bounds. And absolute power corrupts absolutely, guys. I just wanted to make that point because I'd hate to be perceived as someone who believes that their problems are the be-all and end-all. I acknowledge that people in the past had it much worse than I did. Make no mistake about that. But that doesn't mean that we're finished trying to update the system, guys. There's still a lot of work to be done. Ireland still needs to go through a hell of a lot of change, educationally speaking, before things are okay, before things are acceptable. So I hope that's clear. So guys, in closing, I want to address a potential counterpoint. Some people might say, but if we remove religion from schools, won't you be indoctrinating kids into an atheistic worldview? You know, if we take away all the crucifixes and the religious permeation throughout the building, remove all the pictures of Jesus and stop the grace before meals and the prayers in the morning and all that kind of stuff, won't you just be actually indoctrinating them into an atheistic worldview? Won't you just be teaching them that there is no God? Well, guys, the first thing to say is that I'm absolutely not recommending that we remove religion as a subject from schools. After all, I myself am a religion teacher. All I'm recommending is that religious references shouldn't permeate a school. Students shouldn't be taught to pray, for example. Grace before meals shouldn't be conducted by teachers or orchestrated at a school level. And I'm not talking about banning religious practices in prayer. All I'm saying is that such practices should be a personal choice, not conducted by the institution, because schools are supposed to be inclusive. Remember, conducting Catholic prayers ostracizes non-religious pupils, but it also ostracizes pupils of differing faiths. The only way to accommodate all beliefs is to give preferential treatment to none of them. And that includes atheism. I wouldn't support a school which teaches students that God isn't real. I wouldn't support a school that has morning recitations about God's non-existence and where every classroom has a picture of Charles Darwin instead of a crucifix. That would be wrong too. Again, guys, the only way to accommodate all beliefs is to give preferential treatment to none. Guys, there's a massive difference between teaching students about what religious people believe on one hand and teaching students how to be religious on the other. I would never recommend that we remove religion from schools. Religion is an incredibly important subject. It's in religion class that we learn about the beliefs of others. That makes us more tolerant. Understanding different religions makes us less likely to have bigoted opinions about them. That's so straightforward. Again, to reiterate, there's a difference between teaching someone about religion on one hand and teaching someone how to be religious on the other hand. I think that the education system should teach, not preach, 
And I think Ireland has a hell of a lot of change to undergo before things even approach acceptable. And those are my thoughts on indoctrination. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, guys. As I always say, if you have any comments or questions or you want to get involved in the debate, please jump into the comments below. I'd love to have a dialogue with you guys. If you think I've missed something, if I've gotten something terribly wrong, again, I want to know about it. I want my opinion to be correct. And if I want it to be correct, I have to be willing to adopt new evidence, new ideas. And if I've missed something, if you have a point that I haven't considered or something that I've just missed out, I want to know about it because I want to be able to update my view if indeed there's something that I've missed. So guys, on that note, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of A Magician's Thoughts On. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have, please do consider dropping a like. And you know, if you've been enjoying the content more generally, do consider hitting that subscribe button. I hope today is the day that I earn that subscription. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you guys in the next one. All the best. Bye-bye.